damn, damn! Is this the magic school bus? Is this the magic school bus? 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 I want to be the magic school bus! I want to be the magic school bus! Magic school bus! A simple molecule, sugar forms crystals as a rule. Dissolve some sugar in water, you'll see the blend together like you and me. Whoa, yeah, uh huh. Whoa, yeah, uh huh. Hello, Molly School Bus. I, I mean, Magic School Bus. Hi, I have a little bitty question about the molecule show. Well, I'm listening to the concert. Can you call back when it's over? I'll be quick. But... No what's about it. No real bits either. Your show is wrong, wrong, wrong. What do you mean? You said when you get down to the very last bit, end up with molecules. The molecules aren't the smallest bits there are. Atoms are smaller. Molecules are made up of atoms. That's exactly right. Atoms are smaller than molecules, and molecules are made up of atoms. But molecules are the smallest bits that give things their basic properties. You mean the way water molecules make water flow and pour? Yep, and soap molecules make soap slip and slide around in the water. So, what thinks molecules give it its characteristics, its personality? Correct. Molecules are cool. They totally rule. Bye. Magic school bus. Is everything in the whole really made of molecules? Yes, everything is made of molecules and atoms. Your shoes, your friends, your toothpaste, your popcorn. Thanks for calling. Goodbye. The building blocks of everything on Earth. A molecule is a little bit of the universe. Magic School Bus, producer speaking. I have some questions about the egg show. You're not too chicken to ask them, are you? Please, we've all had enough egg and chicken jokes for one day. Well, excuse me. <laughs> Knock it off, okay? Here's my question. In real life, how long does it take a hen to make an egg? One day. And in order to be fertilized, an egg needs something from the hen and a rooster. That's how it was on your show about salmon. The salmon eggs needed something from each parent before they could grow into fish, right? Right. And eggs you buy in the store have not been fertilized. They're laid by hens that are kept away from the roosters. Ever heard about candling eggs? Of course I have. It's a way of finding out if an egg is fertilized or not. Now, the process used to be done with candles, but today you can use a flashlight, as long as it's a really strong one. I know. If you hold an eating egg up to the light, you won't see anything but a yolk inside. But in a week old fertilized egg, you can see the chick embryo already starting to grow inside the egg. Neat, huh? Neat? It's extraordinary. Talk about bad egg jokes, huh? You hungry, Liz? Hmm, how about an omelet? Poached eggs on toast? Eggs Benedict. How about a squashed fly sandwich? <laughs> I knew I'd find something you'd like. So what do you say, Liz? You want that fly on egg bread? Or how about some eggnog to wash it down? Or how about some... Hey, Liz. 
Hey, come on, let's walk along the beach and see what we can find. You'll love it. Let's go. Chill out, Liz. It's just the wave moving the water in and out. Oh, look at... Oh, here, could you hold on to that? Hello, Magic School Bus. The things you find on the beach. Do mussels and sea stars and barnacles really live in separate zones? Or were you just doing that because it made a better story? No, it's true. Sometimes the zones aren't as clear as we showed, but you can still see them if you look carefully. These zones aren't only on rocks, but on piers and pilings at the shores. Everywhere they pick places to live, according to how well they can cope with the changes of the tide. Uh, thanks for calling. <laughs> hey Liz, you want some help with that stuff? I think you'd better leave that snail there, Liz. All these plants and animals are well suited for their particular places on the shoreline. But humans and lizards can accidentally destroy their homes and their lives. Better to take nothing but trash and pictures and leave behind nothing but footprints. Now let's go home. <laughs> What's up? Magic School Bus Produce Air speaking. <laughs> well, Mr. Produce Air, when it comes to the truth, your air show has some major leaks. And I bet you're going to point them out, right? <gasps> That's what I do. Air out the facts. <laughs> to begin with, whoever heard of pink air? It's ridiculous. You're right, but since air is invisible, we made up the extraordinaire so everyone could see the air our kids had to work with. And that business about using air pressure to blast Keisha and Ralphie into the sky to meet the space capsule? Unreal! Not really. <laughs> Haven't you ever seen someone fired out of a cannon at the circus? Sure. Well, some of the cannons use air pressure to do it. Although I bet nobody's used air pressure to blast two kids thousands of feet in the air. You're right, because it's impossible. You just can't get that kind of air pressure. But I bet you can make a bottle rocket that uses air pressure to shoot hundreds of feet in the air. Maybe, but only if you use a combination of air pressure and water. And that makes a difference? You bet. It's the strength of the air pressure pushing out the water that rockets the bottle up into the air. How clever. All I know is, when it comes to just making stuff up, it seems like the sky's the limit with you guys. Which is why we always end the show with a disclaimer. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for calling. Magic School Bus producer here. Kid here. I've got a flood of questions. Okay, swamp me. <laughs> Is that place called a swamp or a wetland? In the show, you called it both. Actually, it is both. A swamp, a marsh, a bog, any low-lying place that is wet at least part of the year is called a wetland. And what about all that yuck floating around? Surely it's not okay to deliberately dump oily water and gunk in a wetland because the wetland helps to get rid of it. Good point. It's never okay to pollute. And don't call me Shirley.
You already use that line in your spider show. Now about the floods. Floods don't usually happen as quickly as you showed. Water takes time to build up. Are you trying to kid us or something? Look, if there's one thing I've learned, you can't kid a kid. Since we only had 30 minutes, we sped the whole thing up. And does the wetland really help clean the water supply? See for yourself. Just take a glass of water, add some dirt, and stir it around with a spoon. The stirring motion is like the current stirring up the mud in the river. Then pour the muddy water into a glass baking dish. And that's your wetland. A dish of muddy water. Almost. Let it sit for about an hour. And you'll see how all the heavy mud has settled to the bottom. And the water on top is a lot cleaner. And that's one way a wetland works to clean things up. But even though it's cleaner, you shouldn't drink the water. It hasn't gone through the waterworks, so it isn't safe for human or lizard consumption. Thanks for calling, and remember... I know! The, the wetland, wetland is, is the, the best, best land! land. Come in. Ooh, you managed to get me some food. I'm starving. Magic School Bus, the producer speaking. I don't see what's wrong with eating seaweedies. Aren't carrots and seaweed really good for you? You bet. I love seaweedies. The thing is, that's all Arnold was eating. Your cells need lots of different things to stay healthy. So, how come Arnold turned orange and not green from the seaweed? If he'd been eating only grapes, would he have turned purple? No, and that's because the orange in carrots is different from other food colors. It's a substance called carotene that your body can't get rid of as fast as other food colors. So you mean, if I eat too much food with carotene, I would turn orange like Arnold? Yep, but you'd have to eat an awful lot for a really long time. Bye. All right, time to eat. Magic school bus. You know, it's not just what we eat and drink that affects our body cells. It's not? It's also the air we breathe and how much rest and exercise we get. As Ms. Frizzle says, take care of your cells and your cells will take care of you. Bye. Man, my cells are getting mighty hungry. Magic school bus. Do new skin cells really divide and rise to the surface that quickly? No, no, no. A skin cell takes about a day to divide and 30 days to get to the surface. Meanwhile, the old cells dry out and flake off. I guess you had to speed it up to tell the whole story in half an hour, huh? You got it. Thanks for calling. Bye. That's it. I'm putting on the answering machine. So, what's for dinner, Liz? Oh, oh. Well, uh, this food might be what a lizard cells need, but I'm going out for a pizza and a salad. Coming? <laughs> Enjoy. It's a fine night for looking at stars, Liz. It's clear as a bell up there. Now, who would be calling at this hour? Hello? Is this the star of the Magic School Bus? Well, I am the producer. Good. About your show on stars, no one can visit the stars in a flying space bus. Who are you trying to kid? Well, even though astronauts have been to the moon and back, you're right. The stars are just too far away to reach with today's spacecraft. Okay, but suppose we did build a spacecraft. How long would it take to get there? <laughs> a lifetime. The stars in our show were so far away that to get there and back before you grew old, you'd have to travel faster than the speed of light. And you can't travel faster than the speed of light. But Miss Frizzle took the kids there. Hey, that's why she drives a magic school bus. It was the only way to get there. Well, there's something else bothering me. Since our sun is a star, well, you know, it's not going to... Go out? Well, yeah, it will, but not for a long, long time. It's been shining for over four billion years, and it's got another four or five billion years to go. Whew, that's a relief. One more question. You guys sure made that new star in a hurry. 
How long does it really take? It takes millions of years to form a new star from the leftovers of an old one. Millions of years in a couple of minutes? You guys are always speeding up time, but this show takes the cake. You mean Liz takes the cake. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Good night. You ready, Liz? Perfect. A new constellation. The Constellation Magic School Bus. Hey, Liz, want to go one-on-one? -on -one? <laughs> Sorry, Liz. <laughs> magic school bus, the producer speaking. Since when can a school bus, even a magic one, become a planet? Never underestimate the magic of the magic school bus. And what about the magic of how the kids move when there was different gravity? That change in gravity may have been caused by magic, but the results were real. With stronger gravity, it would be harder to move, and things built for normal gravity would break. With weaker gravity, well, it looked just like that when the astronauts walked and jumped on the moon. But wouldn't it have been easier to just change the pull of the Earth's gravity? Why go to all the trouble of making your own planet? Well, first of all, how much gravity you have depends on how much stuff there is in the planet underneath you. The only way to get less gravity on Earth would be to remove a big chunk of it to make it smaller and give it less pull. Not a good idea. So, does that mean that small planets, like Mars and Pluto, have less gravity than Earth? You got it. Liz, what are you doing? Would a pulley and rope really work with all that extra gravity? Absolutely. No matter how much gravity you've got, you can always lift something as long as you use more force than gravity pulls down. Uh, thanks for calling. Bye. Liz, what is going? And the lizard scores! <laughs> that was fantastic, Liz. You really put your weight into it. You want to do it again? <laughs> Guess not. <laughs> Magic school bus, the producer smelling, I mean speaking. Yeah, right. What I want to know is, how come when I have a cold and my nose is stuffed up, I can't taste my food? Because how food tastes is mostly a matter of smell. When your nose is all stuffed up with mucus, the smell molecules can't reach the smell receptors. It's also why it works to hold your nose when you don't want to taste something nasty. No smell, no taste. Thanks for calling, and get rid of that cold. Magic School Bus. Yeah, hi. I was wondering why some smells like banana and cinnamon in my hamster's cage smell stronger than others, like, say, milk or rice. The answer to that one is a piece of cake. Mmm. You see, some things just give off more smell molecules than other things do. So, the more smell molecules that reach your nose, the stronger the smell. As far as we know, and some kinds of smell molecules trigger a more powerful reaction from the receptors than others. I guess the world of smell is nothing to sniff at. <laughs> you got it. Thanks for the call. Magic school bus. Hey, it's Arnold. How you doing? Arnold? I is it really you? Of course it's me. I've been dying to ask you this question. How come some things have no smell at all, like glass or my rocks? Well, there are two reasons. One is that some things, like glass, don't give off any smell molecules. And the other is that some smell molecules, like the ones that come from water, don't trigger any receptors. Hey, thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Liz, what are you doing as if I didn't know? Smells good, huh? <laughs> and I guess it tastes good too, though I'll probably never know, huh? Ah, 
Magic School Bus, the producer speaking. Hi, I just saw your show on electricity, and my mom told me never to play with electricity in my house. Batteries are fine, she said, but the electricity we use to power our homes is very dangerous. Your mom's right. We made the electricity in Ms. Frizzle's house all come from batteries, so it would be safe for the class. Flashlights, for example, are safe to handle, but the electricity in your house is much, much more powerful, and as you said, can be dangerous. That's right. You should never, ever touch bare wires, any place, any time. Right. And don't ever play with electrical cords, plugs, or outlets either. You got it. And don't forget, electricity and water do not mix. Never fiddle with anything electrical around a sink, bathtub, or shower. One more thing. Opposite charges are really called plus and minus charges, right? Right. They're called that so you can tell they're opposites. Bye. Magic school bus. What about the colors of the charges? Electricity isn't really red and blue, is it? Well, charges are really invisible, so we use the specks to color them red and blue to make it easier to tell them apart. Well, I thought it was pretty cool. I'm glad. Thanks for calling. Bye. Oh, Liz, is that for me? <laughs> and these are for you. <laughs> this is great, Liz. Happy Valentine's Day. glad we did the computer show. I mean, how often do you get to see how a computer works from the inside? Hey, you think that thing could get me a cup of coffee? Magic School Bus, the producer speaking. Hi, I just watched your computer show, and I was wondering, can you really see the information traveling around inside a computer? Yeah, I wish you could, but the information gets changed into electronic signals that are invisible. So how come we saw the information as flashes of light? It was our way of making the electronic signals visible, and then we slowed them down so the kids could follow them. So is the fact that electrical impulses travel so fast why a computer can follow instructions so quickly? Right as RAM. The computer can read information faster than you or I could read it, or type it, or even think it. Okay, I buy all that. But can you really make a computer do jobs like the kids did? Sure. Since computers can turn switches on and off, anything that can be run by a motor can be run by a computer. Although there are a lot more steps to running a program than we had time to show, the idea is the same. You give the computer instructions through the keyboard or floppy disk. The CPU in the motherboard makes decisions based on the instructions, and the computer stores them so it can use them over and over as needed. But the inside of a computer is a lot more complicated than you showed. Yes, but the parts are all basically the same. Disk drive, motherboard... CPU, hard disk, thanks. I get the picture. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Oh, thanks, but I don't really want it anymore. <laughs> Joke! <laughs> Mmm, that computer makes a great cup of coffee. <laughs> I wonder if we have any wild animals living out here, Liz. <laughs> I don't care what you say, Liz. You were in the show. Keep looking. Hello, Magic School Bus, the producer speaking. Hi, how come a fox can make it in the city, but a bear can't? Well, as you saw in the show, there aren't enough places for bears to hide, and they can be dangerous. If a bear tried to stay in the city, it would have to spend all its time hiding from humans, like it did in our show. Right. Now how can I tell if any wild animals live near me? 
Well, some wild animals are all around, only you forget about them. Squirrels, for example, and birds. You can use binoculars to watch squirrels and birds close up without bothering them. And sometimes, even if you can't see the animal, you can see signs they've been there, like tracks in the dirt or scat. That's the polite name for animal poop. There are books that will tell you whose tracks or scat you found. Hey Liz, I think we've got a raccoon living out here. But when you do see a wild animal, don't try to approach it since it may be dangerous. I have some raccoons that live near me that are real pests. Is there any way I can persuade them to move someplace else? Sure. Find out what they're eating and make sure they can't get it anymore. If their needs, like food, aren't met, they'll move on. Also, clean up any garbage and make sure trash is tightly covered. Thanks for the tip. I'll try that. You know, you were right, Liz. You weren't in this show very much. So, do you want to be in it now? <laughs> now that's what I call a wild animal in the city. <laughs> Magic School Bus, the producer speaking. Hi, I just watched your show on coral reefs and thought it was terrific. But I have a couple of questions on this partnership thing. Fire away, buddy. Is it true that most animals have partners like the ones you showed? Well, partnerships are a little unusual. That's why they're so interesting. Most of the time, animals compete with each other for things like space, mates, and most often food. Partnerships happen when each animal partner benefits the other and each does better as a result. And coral reefs are a good place to see that happening. But some animals just benefit from other animals without giving back, right? Absolutely. Take the coral reef crab, for example. It lives under the spines of the black sea urchin. Now, the urchin doesn't get anything out of it, but the crab gets some well-needed protection. Cool. Okay, now tell me the truth. Is a coral reef really alive? You bet it is, pal. The hard coral is part of the shell-like home of the polyps, and millions of polyps live together building the reef year after year. Do reefs really get sick like you showed? Unfortunately, they do, for lots of different reasons, including pollution and other human activities that harm reefs and the animals that live in them. Speaking of animals, aren't the ones that cooperate just being nice to each other? Sorry, animals aren't nice, except maybe to their babies. In fact, they tend to eat each other a lot. Thanks for calling, and thanks for your interest in coral reefs. Hey, coral reefs are one of the world's great treasures. We need to do what we can to protect them. You got that right, partner. <laughs> Aren't you going to share your lunch, partner? Uh, never mind. <laughs>